Hello, AP World History students. Happy Monday. Uh, welcome to our e-learning lesson for today. So um, this uh, lesson marks the end of our, our Unit 1, which is uh, that global snapshots tour, right? Looking around the world at roughly the year 1200 and, and seeing what we see in all these different places in the world. And, and, and uh, this lesson brings us to Japan, a place we haven't been to before. Uh, and so we will get to see some some lovely novelties and, and, uh, and unique pieces. We're also going to see some connections with China, perhaps with Southeast Asia, even some similarities to Western Europe in certain ways. Uh, we're going to be having our eye on continuities, on things that are sort of continuous throughout Japan's history. Uh, and we're also going to, I'll just let you know to give you a framework, we're going to be looking a lot at um, literary and artistic tradition. Um, so that's some of a, that's just a framework for the stuff we're going to learn here in lesson 1.8. So tell you what, let's jump in. Um, so Japan has a very, very old history, right? Like the Japanese culture is, is rich with continuities, um, political continuities, cultural, ethnic continuities going back for millennia, literally. Uh, a couple continuities that I'll point us toward here. One, is a is a political one right the the yamato dynasty of emperors has been uh in power uh and and ruled japan ostensibly since 400 bce a very very long time all right and that's going to remain in place right up here at 1200 and then ongoing well after that right uh and so we'll learn that you know that's maybe it's not all that it might be cracked up to be right or, or the the position of the emperor of japan maybe has a little bit less power than you might guess um i note that it's sort of symbolic but it is remarkable that there is just this one dynasty across uh, japan's history this yamato dynasty uh and so uh that that is a that gives a sense that this japan is a place that um that uh, holds on to certain pieces of its identity, just like we all do, right? But like those pieces, those roots stretch very deep into Japan's history. An old idea, ideology, a religion uh, in Japan's history is, is, the, is the practice of Shinto. Um, and Shinto, we would sort of say it's generally kind of a nature worship, right? It's animistic in the sense that, like, it believes that the elements of nature, the, the forest, the bodies of water, um, uh, are, are, are gods, right? That they have a, a spiritual quality themselves. Um, Shinto also, as time passed, it sort of folded in elements of ancestor worship, uh, perhaps or probably picked up from from China. Now, this is not the only religious tradition in China. We'll learn about uh, Buddhism. Uh, in J uh, this is not the only religious tradition in Japan. We'll learn about Buddhism coming in from China. Uh, but but Shinto is a practice that is sort of has very deep roots. This uh, shrine you see here in red. This is a uh, a, a symbol that we might see from time to time uh, in Japan's history. That is a Shinto shrine. And you can find Shinto shrines typically in kind of remote, rustic, um, natural locations, right? Not, not inside huge um, urban temples or anything like this. And lastly, uh, there's a continuity, a kind of a funny one, that there's sort of this love-hate relationship with the outside world, in particular with China. Uh, Japan would go through stretches of time when they were uh, quite intentionally kind of copying China and picking up and grabbing elements of Chinese culture or political practices. And then there's times when Japan would kind of close its doors off. Um, and this would happen later on in their history. We'll learn this with regard to the Western world, where there's times where it's like, we don't want to be part of it. We're cut off. We're isolated. No, 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 never mind. We want to copy it and pick up all these ideas from you. So that sort of like love-hate relationship with the outside world is, is just an idea uh, that I want you to put in your back pocket with regard to Japan, and we'll see it play itself out a few times. All right, so an idea I want us to understand. Uh, let's start with the political theme in our course. How does political power work in Japan? Well, um, you have to be careful when you're sort of summarizing something that's as old and as complex as Japan. But let's say in general, for much of Japan's history, political power was decentralized, right? It was not like all the power was held in the position of the, emperor, in the, of the emperor or all the power sort of held and contained in the capital and then sort of dispersed out and controlled that way. Instead, it looked a little more decentralized, like something like what was going on in Europe, all right? Um, there were these emperors. The Yamato clan of emperors was there, right? That's present. 
But at the same, and while the emperors were uh, revered and 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 very significant uh, in in uh, Japanese culture, and certainly like um, you know given symbolic significance, all right, uh, in in Japanese political culture, the fact of the matter is that the the emperor was essentially a figurehead, all right. Uh, like a symbol of of Japan, maybe not unlike the way that that Queen Elizabeth II is a is symbolically very significant in Great Britain, and she sort of represents the nation. But like in terms of what political authority does she have, it's pretty limited, right? She's a nice lady who who waves at people and wears expensive jewelry, right? And so so that's kind of like the the Yamato emperors, right? They would spend half their day, you know in this like ep- super formal ceremonies like getting dressed literally or eating or you know tea ceremonies stuff like this would just take up all their time and and the actual work of political power and actual political power was held by lords right or warlords if you prefer right uh, there's a criticism that sometimes when when Europeans did it we called them lords when people in other parts of the world did feudalism we called them warlords right so the, you can use the term interchangeably they mean about the same thing it's like a guy that holds a bunch of land right and has his own private army and basically has a little fiefdom they've got their own little kingdom right and they've got some arrangement worked out with with the emperor and they're probably in competition and in conflict with other regional lords right so what's going on politically in Japan is is uh, if you're going to say it's similar to anything else in the world it's probably similar to, to what's going on in, in Western Europe this interesting pattern where you have a revered and symbolically significant emperor who also ironically doesn't actually hold a lot of political power and make a lot of political decisions that's consistent for many centuries in Japanese history right um, and uh, and and the the question of who does have power will change right at this point it's like uh, administrators or regional lords and later on it'll be a shogun we'll learn about that or or like a, a, cl- a small clique of military leaders perhaps later on like that's all going to come later on but essentially you have these Yamato emperors they're very important right they're very busy doing their sort of uh, symbolic work and otherwise in terms of political power they don't have much and oftentimes political power was sort of lower to the ground okay so let's talk about culture all right um i want to focus in particular on aristocratic culture around the year 1200 let's say circa 1200 um we know a lot about it um we know a lot about it because um we have a lot of writings from the aristocratic culture uh from from the aristocratic circles in japan and uh and interestingly intriguingly a lot of those writings were from women and they're they're definitely writing about their world, uh, and they're writing for an audience of people similar to them. And you'll look at an example of that later on. Um, but aristocratic culture in Japan is uh, is deeply refined and um, fashionable and courtly, right? This is not like the writings that we have are not about the writings of sort of you know, people working nine to five jobs and, you know, kind of, it's not like a Bruce Springsteen song <laughs> set in, you know, feudal Japan. It's like, these are, this is the courtly class of people. These are the fancy people. These are the people who are mannered and aristocratic. And we know a lot about their, their world, right? Um, you, you read their writings and you will read their writings, right? Your, your handout, your notes has a, at the back, it has an excerpt from something called the Pillow Book. And I'll talk, I'll explain what that is in a second. But even as you're reading this excerpt, you'll pick up on the fact that like when it describes what a woman is wearing, it's talking about like her, she wore these, this four layers of silk kimonos and there's like a rose colored one and then a mauve and then an orange and then a lovely lavender below that. Like they're going on about the color combinations of stuff like this or like um, a person's penmanship and how good it was or the stationery they wrote on and, and what color it was and the sort of perfume that was put on it or, or floral arrangements, things like this. And, you know, sometimes to my eyes, I'm just like, good grief, who cares, right? But like they cared. The point is they cared. The point is it was deeply important to them. You can read this and get a sense of like what is important to these people in this culture. You know, there might be the occasional reference to a farmer, but that would be by accident, you know? And again, that's, you know, that's 85, 90% of uh, Japan's, you know, 
population at this time, but that's not the point, right? For these folks, they're, they're writing, it's like by, of, and for themselves. Um, but it's still like a wonderful record we have, and it's really evocative, and it's really distinct, you know, this, this image of this woman and her cat notwithstanding. To give you a couple examples or evidence points of this, the tale of Genji from roughly 1000 CE is considered by many people to be the world's first novel uh, uh, by, boy, I'm going to forget her name now, and so uh, the, I'm going to get, people are going to comment on this, but maybe off the top of my head, I think the person who wrote it is named Lady Murasaki. That might be wrong. You can look that up and correct me in the comments if you need to, guys. Uh, the Pillow Book, uh, which is written by another woman, you will get to, to read this for yourselves and respond to this. Um, but really, they're, they're, they're really wonderful. Uh, I, I think they are like, they're not, um, they're not overly Baroque in their um, writing style. It's not like this impenetrable language. In fact, the language is very frank. It's very um, plain and open in a certain way. It certainly is frank and open about sex. Um, so this will, that'll get you to read the reading here. <laughs> but you'll get a sense that like their attitudes, courtly attitudes about marriage, um, and romantic love and sex were, let's just say, different from how we tend to see it today, right? Uh, and it's not how my marriage works, let's put it that way. Uh, and so, but there's always this sense of like, there's a way to do things. There's a proper way to do things. There's a proper way that we do things. And what do you mean the proper way? Well, the proper way is really defined by this, this term in here, this word um, aware, like this sense of kind of refined detachment, kind of an elegant acceptance that nothing lasts, nothing stays, but you notice the small details, right? Like there's so many references in this thing you're gonna to read to like the dew in the morning. And that's the idea of the dew of the morning, like it's, it's there for a bit and then it's gone, right? But it's sort of this poignant um, observation of those things that are there and they're lovely and then they move on. And if you're saying, if you're catching that this sounds kind of, this sounds like it almost rhymes with certain ideas in Buddhism about like the, the elimination of desire, right? Uh, then I'd say, yeah, you're, you're, you're seeing a connection that's absolutely there and that these ideas are tied to one another. And so, you know, is this the most important thing, this sort of literary style in, in, in world history? No, it's just lovely, all right? Uh, and on some level, I just, you know, in our course, let's be, let's be, Christians who can sort of pick something up and just appreciate it. Also, we're going to just understand like um, attitudes that we've adopted um, culturally and religiously about love, marriage, sex, things like this are, are not necessarily universal, right? Um, and so the way we think about them, there might be people who think about them in a very different way and ask yourself, you know, what, what will that produce, right? Like, what, or why, why might the ideas that we've been sort of like we that have been reinforced or taught or shown to us like what might that how might that point us in a different direction from what we see in that reading okay or maybe what you see in you know different parts of american culture right or or you know in the media something like that let's let's pivot here from from women to men um something that a lot of you guys especially you boys as soon as you see like we're doing japan they go okay cool samurai uh, and yeah we probably should talk about the samurai a little bit I mentioned earlier that Japan has some interesting similarities with Western Europe uh, and that there's kind of a feudal style system of power and that's true and, and sort of like Europe in, in a feudal system, in, in Europe's feudal system, knights were kind of a key piece, like a trading piece in the feudal system and knights themselves were people who had hopes for acquiring land at some point and, and samurai played a very similar role in Japan's feudal system. Um, the samurai were like an elite uh, warrior class, uh, and they were like the like a European knight. They were esteemed like the European knights. They were it was uh, it involved a, a lifetime of training, and there's a kind of a stylized way in which they fought like European knights. It was an expensive thing to be a samurai, right? Like the armor that you wore. It ain't stuff you pick up at the dollar store, right? I mean, this is stuff that's like, this is intricately made and passed down over time. And so it, it, feudalism in both places, in part, <laughs> it's decentralized because it's expensive to field an army of knights. It's expensive to field an army of samurai. Now, there's some differences too, right? 
the samurai had a little bit more sense of like the the, the bushido code for samurai was a little bit more uh, built around the idea of selflessness rather than chivalry which is about like fighting for god or to protect you know courtly women or to protect the commoners or something like this um the samurai code the bushido code is much more about um selflessness like you must selflessly uh, be like loyal to the end to your lord to your daimyo um you carried these two swords right and one sword was for you to sort of carry out your um your military duty right uh for your lord or also by the way a samurai was like you know i mentioned this they're police judge jury and executioner in japanese society like if if there's a dispute between two people you go to a samurai you plead your case the samurai right then and there decides you know here's meets out decides the the penalty right and the consequence and meets out justice i mean maybe right then and there he cuts off someone's hand or a head or something like that i mean who you know i'm getting a little carried away but like that's that's a role that the samurai could play out in this uh, day and age um the other sword was reserved strictly for seppuku which is ritual suicide like disemboweling yourself cutting out your own intestines if you'd been uh, defeated or dishonored meaning dishonored meaning you you failed to um uphold your daimyo's orders or you you, know, you didn't do that uh and once you'd been dishonored then you needed to sort of commit this ritual suicide let's read a, an excerpt here uh this book is written much later than our period of time but it's describing an idea of bushido that w existed between 1200 and 1450 so let's let's read this and again we're listening for what are the values inherent in this way of life okay it says the way of the warrior which is what bushido means the way of the warrior is to find a way to die if a choice is given between life and death the samurai must choose death there is no more meaning beyond this make up your mind and follow the predetermined course Someone may say, you die in vain if you do not accomplish what you set out to do. That represents an insincere approach. When you are forced to choose between life and death, no one knows what the outcome will be. Man always desires life and rationalizes his choice for life. At that very moment, if he misses his objective and continues to live as a samurai, he must be regarded as a coward. If he misses his objective and chooses death, some may say he dies in vain and he's crazy but this must not be regarded as a shameful act it is of utmost importance for the way of the warrior day and night you make a conscious effort to think of death and if you are ready to discard life at a moment's notice you and the way of the warrior will become one in this way you can perform your duties for your master without fail students i hope that as you're you're certainly picking up a value of of selflessness right sacrifice loyalty um, obedience and honor but i hope you're also saying again this sounds i'm, I'm kind of hearing like buddhism a little bit i'm hearing strains of of buddhism and i'd say exactly very good All right um buddhism is introduced it's it's a it's a mahayana buddhism is introduced to japan via china right through china um and this this uh this religion i was going to call it a philosophy it's a philosophical religion right this religion is very popular with the samurai class because it just really it takes those those values and it sort of it weaves them together well with the sort of cosmic sense of like you um you know uh, of what we are right and this notion of like wanting to empty out yourself of any desires um and uh and zen buddhism Zen Buddhism is like a particular type of Mahayana Buddhism and Zen Buddhism is the practice of Zen Buddhism is is interesting right like a a meditative act is uh is sort of like carefully thoughtfully precisely doing your everyday tasks right like if your everyday task involved you know stapling papers together and three hole punching them like doing it with sort of a careful thoughtful elegant poignant rigidity and you do it the same way every time and as you're doing this you're literally kind of emptying out yourself a zen garden like you you look at this image uh, a zen garden dating back to the 15th century like the rocks the sand is sort of raked it has this sense like a, when you look at a zen garden or even someone talks about a moment of zen it's sort of you get this sense of like stillness 
things slowing down, stopping, your mind slowing down, stopping. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a type of meditation, right? This became very popular with, uh, with the samurai. Um, and I don't want to get into all the details, but certainly it's enough for you to know that like um, the samurai philosophy uh, had woven into it these elements of Buddhism, and that's, that shows up in Japanese culture. Okay, so as we wrap up. We'll note my big idea that I'm saying here, Japan's ability to borrow, borrow from China, um, borrow from elsewhere extensively, sometimes intentionally, while also developing its own distinctive civilization here in this period of time, uh, will kind of create an interesting model. And this will happen again later in our course when we get to the period of time from like 1750 to 1900, where Japan will kind of do a similar thing uh, with regard to the West, all right? So we'll see them this kind of circle back Again, I want you to have your eyes out for that and asking you, what strikes you from this lesson? What seems like a particularly key detail or idea to remember about Japan as we move ahead? Okay, so students, what you're going to do, do now with the rest of our time on Monday, I want to have you read this excerpt from the pillow book. All right, It's not long, so we'll read just that little piece. Um, respond to a question, a reflection question about that reading on Google Classroom. There's a link to it in, in your learning plan. And then, of course, there's the, the reading check for tomorrow where you'll review all this information there. Okay, guys, um, great work. I look forward to seeing you in class tomorrow, and we will talk soon. See ya.